Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I hope uh, when I'm done with uh, my pro in 16 months that uh, they will say, even though, you know, you're a little different from John Burton in terms of personality. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that they will say you were a lot like John Burton. Because that would be the highest compliment. <laughs> I thank you. I thank all of my colleagues who are here. I sent a colleague out to the DS Benjamin, who made a great Secretary of State. He's my seatmate and does such a great job. And Betty Yee, again, for controller, just uh, great stuff. Great public service. It will never be on Betty's political resume, probably, but, but for Betty, I never would have gotten started with my mental health work. And but for John Burton, I never would have gotten started because I was a, I was a naive, freshman with actually dark hair and longer hair <laughs> back in 98. And I had this idea that I wanted to put $300 million in the building mental health system and didn't know any better. And John Burton and Betty Yee helped me work with then Governor Gray Davis. We got $10 million. And we were on our way to $55 million and then to a billion through Prop 63 and we have not stopped our I want to recognize our Senate political director, Lisa Gasparoni, as well. <laughs> I am so proud to be a Democrat. And I'm even more proud to be a Democrat as I enter the latter part of my fifth year as a Senate leader. And I'm not nearly done yet, by the way. There's still 16 months left to go, but I have begun to reflect a little bit on California. I've begun to reflect a little bit on our party. And I've begun to reflect a lot, actually, on this incredible journey that we have all been on as Democrats and as Californians over the past five years. And when I say I've never been more proud to be a Democrat, it's because of how I've seen our party, our activists, our members, our leaders act, especially in contrast to the other party. Because you know, it's not just how you deal with the good times that matter. It's what the people say and what the people feel about how you deal with tough, seemingly impossible times. And when you look back at the recent history, I've told this story so often, it's, I was elected to this post by my Senate colleagues in late 08, and within several weeks that budget deficit was $42 billion on a base budget of $100 billion. I mean, the numbers were absurd, to be honest. Nobody had ever seen half the budget, essentially half the budget, in deficit. And I know that in 09 and in 10, when Schwarzenegger was the governor, it was far from perfect. But I saw example after example after example of the majority party leading, stepping up, helping this state avoid an economic calamity and beginning to chip away at this damn deficit in a way that led to at least a better beginning for the Jerry Brown era. And I remember many things about that period of time. It would be easy to forget a lot of it, actually, because a lot of it was not pleasant. I know I didn't come to public office and certainly didn't run for leader to make awful cuts, especially in education and health and human services. But there are many things I remember about that period of time. 
I remember fighting with Arnold Schwarzenegger about CalWORKs, which is the best assistance to work program in the country, getting people back to work. People have fallen on hard times. And I remember one Friday we were at an impasse on how to deal with the deficit around some of these issues. And I remember coming back to work, and it was all over the papers, right, that we were fighting with. We got back to work on Monday morning, Schwarzenegger said, I am more convinced than ever that we, that we need to cut these programs even deeper. And I said, well, Governor, what, why? Where were you this week? What did you do this week? He, says, he said, I had lots of conversations with people this weekend. He said, we've got to get these programs deeper. I said, Governor, where were you this weekend? What did you do that made you dig in even more? He said, well, I was with my family on the beach in Malibu, actors, directors, producers, telling me we got to cut these programs. And I said, Governor, those aren't the people that I represent. Those aren't the people I talk to. Those aren't the people who represent the best of California. And so we lived through that kind of crap again and again and again. I remember Jeff Denham. Or is that Jeff Dunham, the ventriloquist? <laughs> Jeff Dunham, Orange County, when the budget was late and got the Republicans wouldn't give an inch, and he finally decided, out of great principle, when I threatened to shut the Senate, lock people in overnight, he finally came and he said, my son has a Little League game tomorrow. I'll vote for the budget just to get out of here. <laughs> Great principle. <laughs> I remember in a serious vein what happened in February 2009 when two very conservative Republican leaders, David Cogdill and Mike Belines, knew that the only way to save California was to vote for some temporary taxes. And they did so. And they convinced four of their other colleagues to do so. And I'll never forget, Dave Cogdill is conservative as I am, liberal and progressive, casting that tax vote, and then getting thrown out of office at 1 in the morning on February 21st, 2009. And Mike Belines losing his leadership two or three weeks later. I'll never forget that period of time and what it said about values, what it said about character, what it said about stepping up when times are tough, what it said about the best and the worst of politics. And I'll never forget, I guess he may be their candidate for governor in 2014. Able. Oh, God. <laughs> or unable. <laughs> Playing every angle, thinking it was his ticket to start him every which way, and man, that lieutenant governor position lasted a long time, didn't it? <laughs> I remember who stood tough and strong and never flinched despite some of those gut-wrenching decisions imaginable. Dallas. It was the Democratic senators, it was the Democratic assembly members who didn't like it, who knew that this wasn't what they wanted to do, but who did what was necessary to make it a little bit better. It was the Democrats. And then in 2010, you worked hard to elect Jerry Brown and pass Proposition 25 and sweep every constitutional office in this state. <laughs> and in 2011 and 12, we didn't have a supermajority, and with bare majority control, we continued pounding away at this beast that I call the deficit. The governor led logically and forcefully. 
and he had great partner <coughs> in the legislature. He came on board, the deficit was down from $42 billion to $26 billion. And he said, very logically, all right, half cuts, half taxes. And he worked for four or five months with that same sense of, this can't be that the Republican Party is so loyal to the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and Grove Northwest. It can't be that they run this hard to hold these offices and they're unwilling to govern. It can't be. He worked for five months and couldn't get a single Republican to defy the right wing of the Republican Party. And as a result, we didn't eliminate that deficit, but just cut it down a little bit farther, mostly with cuts. And then after learning that lesson of what it means to work with that party in this state, he did what any of us would have done. He said, let's work with the Democratic constituencies, let's work with the progressive coalition of the Democratic Party, and let's go to the ballot. There was a CTA, and then it was a CFT, and it was the whole group, and SEO, and the whole group of folks who got together, and Lord knows that was a little bit of a rough road to a while. <laughs> we had a couple separate initiatives. In fact, we had three initiatives, and then it was two initiatives, and it remained two initiatives, and Lord, we thought we were in all kinds of trouble. But you know what? The people had seen that the majority party stepped up, had made the sacrifices, had governed well, had done what was necessary, and with your help, we passed Proposition 30 in November of 2006. And what verdict did the voters render on Democratic leadership in these perilous times? What did they say about how Democrats handled the most challenging times in many decades? How did the voters assess our performance, your performance? Two numbers for you, 29 and 55. <laughs> Super majorities in both houses. They not only said, they not only said keep your majority, they said we want it strengthened. We're tired of divided government. We're tired of a small minority of the minority being able to hold up progress on the most important decisions that our state has to make. We win these supermajorities, and then the pundits have their field day. So many, so many writings, so many speeches about the supermajority. All the wise pundits saying they will overreach. This is terrible for the state. The Republicans out there saying they will stumble. You just watch them. They don't know how to deal with so much power. Well, how is this for a stumble in 2013? The third on-time balanced budget in a row. The structural terrible deficit, which I'm talking about too much, has been erased. We made aggressive payments against the so-called wall of debt, a robust rainy day fund. We reformed the way we fund public education by making sure that lower income kids, poor kids, get more money. We eliminated this low wage tax incentive and turned it into a high wage tax incentive just three weeks ago. <laughs> it may be most heartening for me and for you, for the first time in six years, we were able to begin the restoration and reinvestment of the safety net in California. Now, it's not enough 
but three million low-income Californians will have dental care who have not had dental care. That's something I'm going to I was never so shocked to go to Cal Expo in October of 2012 and see people, low-income working people in line who couldn't afford dental care, who had no insurance. We cut that program in 2001, one of the worst votes I've ever taken in my life out of necessity. And people waiting in line to get root canals fixed. People lost their teeth. People afraid to enter the employment world because they were afraid of what they look like. That's over now. People will get the dignity and the dental care that they need. We raised grants for CalWORKs. We invested in middle class scholarships for middle class college students. And yes, the single largest, no, I should say we also invested $250 million in building vocational ed, career tech ed in our high school. It's an absolute key to ending the dropout rate in this state. Invest in kids. We don't have to choose between high standards and career application. We need to merge them together so every kid gets the education they need and at the same time they're learning what the work world is about and beginning to prepare for a career. $250 million. And yes, the single largest augmentation in the budget on the non-education side for the first time in state history was for mental health. 200 plus million dollars, 2,000 crisis stabilization and residential beds for people who too often end up in emergency rooms and jails or on the streets. 600 permanent triage workers, 25 mobile outreach teams, full mental health parity and substance abuse parity in Obamacare and Medi-Cal expansion. And oh, by the way, we're leading the country when it comes to implementing Obamacare as well. <laughs> For all those pundits out there who wrote that the Democrats would fritter away their supermajority or abuse it or use it ineffectively, I say to you, look at the damn record and you'll see something very, very different. Our work is never done. We get to 29 and we have a member who resigns office. He resigns office for family reasons. And all of a sudden, this supermajority that we've worked so hard for is suddenly at a little bit of risk. And it's not just any seat. It's Senate District 16, which is the heart of the Central Valley. And it's a tough area. And it's especially tough in a special election. And it's especially tough when the Republican candidate had millions of dollars spent on his behalf in a congressional race trying to knock off Jim Costa. We survived the primary and with your help, we're going to win on Tuesday and maintain that supermajority. I, I want to thank all the party members and activists who are making calls this weekend here from Coast Mesa from Orange County. We have an incredible effort going on down there. I know Lisa and I and some of the members are heading down tomorrow. We had these people from the realtors decided they didn't like the fact that we were going to push for a half billion dollars a year for affordable housing for people in need. Didn't like that. They shoved 800,000 bucks up our you-know-what to try to beat us in SD16. And guess what? We're out spending them. We're out organizing them. We're out working them. And if we keep it up for another couple of days, we're going to win this seat and show that the supermajority means something positive, not just for the people of the Central Valley, but for California. So I want to thank you for all you're doing. I want to thank all of our stakeholders and 
detention groups for all you're doing on the outside and on the inside of which the Cecia Perez. And if you haven't met her, she is terrific. She is the role of the progressive Democrat even from the Seneca Valley, former public defender, UFW. She's terrific. And we've got to get her to Sacramento. We've got to get Jose Solario elected as well in 2014 in order And finally, for me, and I'm happy to answer a few questions if that's, uh, if that's part of the format, I want to say another couple words about mental health and why this is so important to me. And why I believe that for the Democratic Party, this ought to be a top tier public health, public priority. This issue, unfortunately, has found itself at the bottom of the funding priority list for far too long. And yet everybody knows somebody. This is an issue that knows no class lines. It knows no race, gender, sexual orientation, neighborhood. It knows none of those artificial lines that so often divide us. Everybody knows somebody. And yet we don't talk about it because of the stigma. It affects every walk of life and every major social problem we care about, whether it's kids struggling in school, whether it's our overcrowded prisons, whether it's homelessness, whether it's family dysfunction, whether it's violence. The root of so much of this is untreated mental health. And what we have proven over the course of the last decade in California with little fanfare is that recovery is possible. We spend a billion dollars a year under this Prop 63, 25% of it for prevention, early intervention, and innovation. We're doing some remarkable things. 75% for people who have fallen through the cracks. And now we have this latest investment in the budget. And yet the need is so great out there. There are still lines. There are still waiting lists. There are still too many people who end up in places where they don't have to be and where their symptoms only get worse because they're not where they should be. And so no matter what your passion may be, whatever makes you a Democrat, whatever issue you fight for or you care about, recognize its link to untreated mental illness. Recognize the imperative of investing more in prevention and early intervention in children's mental health services. Recognize the link between mental health and physical health. Recognize what we have done in this society to criminalize the mentally ill in ways that are inhumane and not cost effective. In my last 16 months, there's a lot I want to do. I want to make sure we do more for autistic kids. That's one thing. Because we've done some great things, but there are too many holes. But I want to finish. I want to finish sort of the way that John Burton finished when he was pro tem, when he built the Mind Institute up there at UC Davis to study and be the leading national researcher on autism and developmental disabilities. We need to do the same for mental health. And we need to do everything we can to put more resources into prevention and early invention and help more people lead better and more productive lives. That's why I'm a Democrat. And after five years of, I'd say four years of absolute hell, <laughs> not for me personally. I mean, you know, I was helping me personally. Too, yeah. But not so much for me personally, but for our state and for the people we care for and we fight for, now we've got a chance, not just in that area, but in so many other areas, to be able to restore and reinvest and make people's lives better. And the people will reward us. They'll return us to office. They'll continue electing Democrats, because if we're smart about it, in the end, they want politicians and leaders to have a little bit of a heart and a little bit of soul. That's why I'm proud to be a Democrat. That's why I'm proud to be with you here today. Thank you for having me.